This is Dr. Tom Rozelle. After 43 years of practice and over a million patient visits, the Rozelle Center for Healing knows what works and knows how you can take control of your health and wellness. My team of doctors practice 21st century integrative medicine. Whether you suffer from chronic pain and fatigue, allergies or headaches, we can help. Take charge of your health before it's too late. Make an appointment today. Call 703-698-7117 or visit online at rosellecare.com. That's rosellecare.com. The information provided on Dr. Tom Rosell Live by Dr. Tom Rosell DC, interview guests, show co-hosts, or substitute hosts is not intended or implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. It is for general information purposes only. Information from this broadcast should not replace the appropriate consultation and examination process by a licensed physician. Always consult your own physician prior to changing any current medical directive or prescription. Dr. Tom Rosell Live, right now on 105.9 FM WMAL. And welcome to Dr. Tom Rosell Live. We are not quite live in studio, but live every single Sunday from 11 to 12. Um, I am Dr. Stephanie Pina. I'm going to be your substitute host for Dr. Rosell this weekend. He is out with the learning hat on so we can bring you more information every single Sunday like we do. But luckily, I don't have to do it alone this week. And with me is going to be your guest uh, presentation or webinar lecture. Um, and we're going to be talking about a topic that is very popular in our office. But with me is going to be Dr. Harlan Browning. How are you doing, Dr. Browning? Doing great. Thanks for having me on, Stephanie. Not a, not a problem. It's always great to have you on. And, and especially with this particular topic that we're going to go over because we, we hear about it. We see it in the office all the time. Um, it's one that we keep repeating because when people really understand what's going on with their body, no matter what it is, they, they certainly have a better idea to look for more natural um, sources of care and health as well, too. So what are we talking about this weekend? We are talking about the three common causes of joint pain. And not only do we see this commonly, but it's also something that, you know, we have to think outside the box often. And it's something that patients come in with thinking it's in one area and it may be in another area. So Dr. Brown is going to be presenting this as a webinar that you can log into um, and register for and get for this Wednesday night, August the 26th at 7 p.m. And you'll receive a the email instructions, be able to watch it via webinar in the safety of your home, and then hopefully come in and talk to us in person as well, too. Dr. Browning, let's go into why this topic is so important, the three common causes of joint pain, and why we keep revisiting it over and over again. Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the misconception that if we have pain in a certain area, the problem has to be in the area um, that's involved. So th that's the, the first misnomer. So we're going to look closer at different pain patterns, be it mechanical or metabolic causes or certainly referred pain patterns. And the underlying cause that I'm gonna talk about throughout the whole presentation is inflammation. Pain is inflammation and inflammation is pain. So if you understand those pathways in which the body produces inflammation, it makes it easier to control it. Now, do you think when we have most of the patients coming in to see us and they're coming in and pain is the main the main reason why they come in or they've been diagnosed with a joint pain like hip pain or some kind of arthritis, that they're having that conversation with their other doctors or when they're diagnosed about inflammation or is this a different way of looking at things? Well, I certainly think that they're having the, the conversation in a roundabout way because most of the first line of defense in you know, traditional medicine as we do in this country is prescribing anti-inflammatories. Mm -hmm. um, so, if the if the patient understands that or not, they they I think that they get the fact that the anti-inflammatory will help their symptom, not necessarily their problem. That's the important thing, but will help their symptom. So inadvertently, we're, we're we're talking about inflammation, but we're we're not explaining the mechanism. I think, and and that's really the problem. And when you talk about the inflammation, which you're going to go over in this lecture and webinar. You know, we're looking at for coming from a different kind of different background, looking at the try to help like the structural, the chemical and mental, emotional. Now, there's also other ways of kind of looking at where those the root cause of this inflammation can kind of come from and reason why it goes right to the joints versus someone else getting inflammation and it's creating a heart issue or um, a digestive issue as well. Why, why do the joints become so um, involved with this? Well, joints are, have fluid in it called synovial fluid, and, and that synovial fluid is, is really responsible for how 
how easy it is for us to move. The problem is with joints, because we use them a lot, they have a tendency to, to break down, either be it the connective tissue that crosses the joint, the ligaments, the tendons, the muscles, or things inside the joint itself, the, the, uh, the cartilage or any other structures inside. So that becomes potentially a weak link, especially as we get older, we start to overuse these joints. And as we do that, the body tries to stabilize the area by mobilizing inflammation. So inflammation for the most part on the short term is, is, is very important and it's good, but the issue becomes people propagate the inflammation and turn it into a long-term event. And then the cycle doesn't get broken. And because inflammation is what we call catabolic, it breaks things down. It just pushes the degeneration in that joint or whatever's going on in that area further along. So we also see that if there's inflammation in a joint, that also might be a clue that there may be other issues going on metabolically, say in the rest of the body, or is it just a, is it usually just localized to that one joint? No, absolutely. So one of the examples we're going to talk about is some of the underlying metabolic conditions. We've all heard of gout. So gout is, is a metabolic process where the body is not processing certain types of amino acids and, and proteins called purines. And what's gonna happen is it's gonna produce these crystalline structures that are gonna infiltrate a joint. So a person might assume that, well, I'm 60 years old, I've got knee pain, it's gotta be osteoarthritis. And, and in many cases, it's not, it's a metabolic thing. They have, they have gout because their diet is so poor. So yeah, definitely joint pain does not have to be because we have a mechanical problem in the, in the joint itself. It can be because the metabolism in the body is not adequate, or maybe the immune system is out of control as well. Yeah, we do see a lot of people kind of coming in, um, not only with things like gout, but like they have different types of infections and all of a sudden the co-infection also leads to different type of joint pains or different autoimmune diseases has that have that affinity for joints as well as say the kidneys and the liver and stuff as well. You know, do we see a rise of that happening currently or kind of when, when patients are coming in, we see a rise of having to be one of the first ones to kind of address that issue? Well, I think overall, at least in my opinion, what I've seen, you know, in my practice over, you know, 20 some years is um, people just aren't as healthy. And I think that's somewhat self-inflicted. We don't eat well. We don't certainly don't sleep or, or get quality sleep. We don't exercise. So we come out of the gate one step uh, behind. If we add on top of that, the environmental influences, the toxicities that are out there, the xenoestrogens, these are like hormone-like mimickers that are in plastics. Um, you know, pollutants, heavy metals, then it just amplifies the process and somehow the immune system has to deal with this. In some folks, it can do it well. In other folks, we start to develop an autoimmune type problem like um, rheumatoid arthritis or, you know, irritable bowels or allergies and all those types of things. Those propagate inflammation and inflammation is what we're going to talk about as far as being the core piece of what's going on as far as pain and joints is concerned. Now I want to bring up in just a, a little bit or in the, after the next break that, you know, when we talk about the joints too from an anatomy physiology situation and in some of your previous lectures, especially your kind of pelvis one kind of shows you that it's not always a clear cut place or a situation where that pain's coming from. It takes a lot of diagnostic skill to figure out, is this a cartilage? Is it in the joint? Is it the bursa? Is it coming from the low back? A completely different joint. But one of the interesting things that I'd like to bring up right now is when we're looking for different spaces, spots of information or, or joint pain, we do, like you said, have to take into consideration the rest of the body. So this might mean taking a look at some of the information, someone information that someone brings in, say lab results beyond just the images that their orthopedic might have given them. Absolutely. And, and um, you know, the, on the, the later part of my presentation, I'm going to talk about lab tests that are specific to give us information about inflammation in the body. And these are things that, that are readily done, not too expensive, that they can do through their primary care or whoever, which just gives you a predictor. Inflammation is, is like a smoldering fire. And sometimes we don't know the fire is going. So we need some sort of metric, some sort of smoke detector, if you will, like these tests that can tell us that there's something going on. So at that point, we can kind of dig deeper and figure out, you know, where is it coming from and, and what can we do to break the cycle? So the three common causes of joint pain are going to be the lecture or webinar for this week. If you're interested in hearing Dr. Brownie, your presenter, and my co-host today, um, talk about this excellent topic that we bring over and over again because people really need to understand why their joints are hurting, why they're kind of seeing consistently 
pain coming back and forth. You can actually register for this by going to rosellecare.com. So that's www.r-o-s-e-l-l-e. C-A-R-E dot com. You want to scroll kind of almost to the middle of the page on that front page, and you'll see a, uh, a little link that says register for three common causes of joint pain. They'll get the same information as if we were doing it as the in-house lecture, and essentially you'll get sent the link on that Wednesday, the 26th, um, approximately around 7 p.m. or right before it. So you'll be able to kind of watch that in your own home. Um, you'll be able to watch as many times as you want. Just like the other lectures we've done as well, too, they'll be posted on the main web page later on as well. So, but you want to get instant access and also kind of learn about some of the benefits and new information that's come out, too, that Dr. Browning's going to do. You can also call the office at 703-698-7117 in order to reserve your spot as well, too. They'll get your email address and they'll send it to you. So there's a number of different ways. Um, if you're in the office as well, you can always register there. Just sign up with the front desk. Um, and hopefully we will be able to get this information to you and see you soon in the office as well. If you have a question for today, you can also give us a call here. We're taking your live questions and you can call in at 1-888-630-9625. Again, that number is 1-888-630-9625. Uh, and if you have any question on joint pain or anything else you wanna ask us, Dr. Browning, one of the interesting things, and I, I brought up a little bit of anatomy before, is when do you, when you look at joint pain that kind of comes and goes, and there's definitely um, an injury or an accident or something, you know, specifically, I fell, I hurt my shoulder. When do we start looking at whether or not other joint pain in different parts of the body are related to that? Well, certainly, if there's an injury, that that's that's helpful for us to to understand what's going on with the person. But like you said, sometimes a person just has migratory episodic joint pain. So one of the slides that I include in this, and I, I pretty much put it in almost all my presentations, is something called knowing your pain type. And you're going to go through and you're going to look at it. Is the pain localized or is it global? Is there a time frame? Does it happen in the morning versus evening? Can you make it better? Can you make it worse? You know, those types of patterns give us an indication um, as far as what's causing the pain. And then obviously, a, a physical examination and further testing, may, maybe some lab tests or, or x-rays, MRIs. At that point, you should have a pretty good understanding of where the problem is. So you have an idea of what you need to do to, to uh, fix it. And so as a, if you have, if someone does bring in that information, especially the imaging, as a chiropractor and applied kinesiologist, do you tend to look at that the same way that the radiologist that writes up the report or the orthopedic uh, physician that's reading it, do you tend to look at the same thing or are you looking at something slightly different? Well, that, that's an interesting question. So obviously uh, the job of the radiologist first and foremost is to find pathology. That means some sort of disease process in the x-ray or whatever the image is. Se secondly, what they're supposed to do is they're supposed to compare whatever they're looking at to normal anatomy. And so sometimes I don't see that reference. A great example is I see people who have a scoliosis or a curvature in their spine, or maybe a lack of a curve in their spine, but yet the radiologist doesn't make a reference to that. That becomes really significant if the person's problem is in that area. If I have neck pain and I have a, a scoliosis or a deviature of my, uh, my curve, then it becomes important. So you need to look at the x-rays, uh, you know, but you can you you can go from the report, but you need to really look at the film for yourself. So you're taking that information in, plus also the inflammation information that we get from say that lab work and stuff, and then have to say what's normal for where you are now and get the other circumstances around it too. Absolutely. All right, we're going to be coming to a break in just a couple of seconds, and we're going to come back talking about the three common causes of joint pain with Dr. Harlan Browning. That's going to be this weekend's lecture, uh, this Wednesday's lecture, and we hope to continue this in just a moment. And welcome back to Dr. Tom Rosell Live. We are sort of live on, on Zoom on our end, but we're basically live for you. Uh, we're taking your phone calls and we are talking about the common causes of joint pain with Dr. Harlan Brown, and which will be this Wednesday's webinar. Um, it's free to you, so we wanna make sure you're able to register for that. We'll be telling you more information about that in just a minute, but we're gonna go to the phones. James, thank you for holding on to us. How can we help you? Listen, thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna be brief so you can help. 
uh, other people. Uh, listen, I want to thank this show. It's by virtue of what I've learned on this show that set me on the path for the doctors to find out what was wrong with me. Now, let me be brief. I just finished uh, my first round of a 14-day course of chelation therapy. The doctors found that I had a, uh, a systemic fungal infection exacerbated by heavy metal toxicity. And the crippling effects, I felt like I had arthritis. I couldn't get out of bed. I could barely move. And it's been three days since I finished the first course. And uh, I feel like a million bucks. But what is the relationship between fungus, heavy metal toxicity, and this crippling effect that I had during this chelation therapy? And uh, I'll let you go. Again, I want to thank you for this show. You've helped a lot of people, and I'm one of them. So with that, I'll I'll take your advice here. <laughs> Dr. Browning? Yeah, so anytime a person has a, an infection, be it a, a fungal, maybe candida, or uh, parasitic or bacteria, limes, those types of things, the body's immune system is going to mount some sort of a, attack on it. The key to that attack is is inflammation. The problem becomes when the immune system can't eradicate the, the pathogen. So it'll try to wall it off. It'll try to slow it down. But when it can't get rid of it, then it's going to continue to send out these messages of inflammation in hopes that somewhere down the line, it can, it can handle the problem. But inflammation causes inflammation. It causes pain. So this, what we would consider to be a non-threatening entity like mold becomes significant when it's in the body for long periods of time. It produces something called an aldehyde, chloral hydrate. An aldehyde is, is similar to an alcohol, and that alcohol will cause lots of neurological issues as well. To complicate that in this, in this gentleman's um, situation, if he has heavy metals, the heavy metals are going to sabotage the body's ability to detoxify, and it's going to suppress the immune system even more. Or maybe sometimes it can even amplify it. So the end product is the person has a lot of times a, a pain syndrome that they can't diagnose. It's getting worse. And then we get a lot of other concomitant issues. We start with pain, and now we have a sleep issue, and maybe now we develop a, a GI issue as, as the body starts to unravel. So in the chelation um, situation, depending on what they're chelating with, they might be giving the person an antifungal or something to actually pull the metals from the body. And very often they'll add in things to support the immune system, vitamin C, glutathione, things of that nature. So as that happens, the body can eradicate the underlying cause, be it fungus or, or metals, and, th and then the immune system can calm down. And then ultimately the inflammation goes back to normal and then the person can actually heal. Well, I think this brings up two great points. So um, thank you, James, for bringing this up because we have to think about those outside sources like environmental toxicities and especially mold in our area in Northern Virginia because it's all around how the outside can kind of affect the inside of us, even though we're thinking more of respiratory issues or allergy or allergy seasons. Um, so I think it's a great kind of combination to see how it affects different parts of the body. And also I know when I was in Arizona and we used to do a lot of chelation for a lot of different things, including heavy metals. One of the interesting things is as it's trying to get some of the toxins and inflammation out of the body or pull some of those heavy metals out, it also likes to pull out some of those key ingredients that we need like magnesium and calcium and some of the trace minerals as well too. So sometimes even during during the treatment, like he was mentioning, you can definitely kind of get some other information, other issues as well too. So supportive measures during that time is always a good thing as well. So. Yeah, and that's why often during chelation, they'll, they'll utilize what's called a Myers cocktail, which yep. has a lot of those nutrients that you just talked about, the magnesium and potassium, because vitamins and minerals are essential for driving our body chemistry of which detoxification is is part of it so when when the detox system becomes really wound up and it's excessive then we're just burning through tons and tons of nutrients so at a certain point let's let's just say vitamin b1 thiamine if we if we start to run low on that and that you know vitamin is a rate limiting component of some sort of process, then that process is going to stop there. We, you know, if we need two screws to build a widget and I only have one screw, we're not building any more widgets. And that's what happens in the body when we start to run out of nutrients. So good nutrition. Yeah. I mean, that just, it goes back to that. When people have very poor diet, they're coming out of the gate, definitely 
behind. Right, and we're assuming we already have that in there before we even start detoxing the body for all the best reasons as well, too. So. Well, and unfortunately, people will, will read about detoxification and do the, the, these things on their own. And in many cases, they, they just amplify the, the condition and make it worse because they don't have the avenues of, of excretion or, you know, they can't, they can't cleanse the body. All right, we're going to be back in just a moment. Dr. Tom Rosell Live continues now on 105.9 FM, WMAL. And welcome back to Dr. Tom Rosell Live. We are talking about the three common causes of joint pain. And your presenter, who's going to be doing this as a webinar this Wednesday, August the 26th at 7 p.m., uh, is going to be posting it, is going to be Dr. Harlan Browning. And he not only is a chiropractor and applied kinesiologist at the Rosell Center for Healing, but uh, has talked on joint issues and mechanical stuff uh, quite a bit. So he definitely knows how to break this stuff down and we see it often in the office. So before we get any further, I wanna make sure you know how to register. You wanna go to Roselle Care, R-O-S-E-C-A-R-E.com, click halfway down and you're gonna see a register button so they'll get some information from you so they can send you this directly to your email. You can also call in the office at 703-698-7117 and tell them you'd like to register for this uh, lecture as well too and they'll get you that information. And don't forget also to scroll down a little further and see all the other past uh, topics that we have recorded for you, whether they were in-house um, from our, our old office to the webinars that we've been doing since March. Um, I'm gonna list, list some of those topics in the, during the next break a little bit, just so you know other things in case you're new to the Rizal Center for Healing and want, new to this show as well too. Uh, some of the things that we discuss and, and give great information on. Lori, I wanna thank you for um, holding on in there. How can we help you? Uh, I had a question about something I heard uh, from Dr. Rosell. Uh, I was uh, riding in the car on the radio and it was just a snippet. Um, he was talking about joints at that time and I had heard about a substance called hyaluronic acid, I guess HA, that it was good for joint pain. But then I thought I heard Dr. Rosell tell some, said something about it collecting in the joint spaces. So I didn't know if that was a good thing or not a good thing or, you know, if it was cushioning. And I was just curious to see uh, what I could find out about that uh, hyaluronic acid related to joints. Sure. Excellent question. And one that we get asked a lot or or people come in with questions on supplementation for joints as well too. So Dr. Browning, you want to take this? Yeah. So hyaluronic acid is, is a component of what makes up our, our joint spaces and the connective tissue in there, along with chondroitin sulfate, glucosamine sulfate, and, and things like that. It, it, it makes up the connective portion of all of that tissue and it certainly gives it a lot of its um, lubrication as well. So as as a standalone therapy, hyaluronic acid, it, it can be beneficial. I think you need to probably look a little bit closer at um, what brought you to the point to, to think that you need to take the hyaluronic acid. Number one is, is it a degenerative condition in the knee? And, and if it is a degenerative condition, is the, is the knee stable, let's say, for example. So if it's not stable and we don't have good muscle balance, that has to be addressed first and foremost before you do anything, because if not, um, the degenerative process is just going to move further, further forward. Um, in, in some cases, there, you know, some, there's some literature that shows injections of hyaluronic acid and all that. Um, I, I don't know if the research is, is there, uh, but I mean, it, it can be a, a part of your, your recovery for sure. So that's a great question. <laughs> Yeah, I had a, a, a torn meniscus and uh, it's been slow to heal, but getting much better. So I was hoping that might be a supplement that might, um, you know, help me get a little faster, re, re, um, you know, return to normal or yeah. normalish anyway. I, I think it's worth, you know, trying. I, I personally, with my patients, will have them take usually a conglomerate of, of substances as opposed to just one standalone. So the glucosamine, the chondroitin, MSM, they're all what we call sulfur donors. I think that um, that's probably a little bit better way to handle it. And when it comes to the meniscus, because the meniscus is relatively what we refer to as avascular, it doesn't have good blood supply. It's really the blood supply is on the outside. It depends on where the tear is um, as far as how quickly it heals. So I have a torn meniscus that I, I did skiing 
probably seven or eight years ago. And it took, a, I would say, a good six to eight months to get to a place to where it didn't really bother me. So it's a slow process, but it'll, it'll, it can happen for sure. Oh, great. Well, that's good news. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and thank you, doctors, for being there this morning. And that's a, such an important, uh, you know, cause is what happens, to, you know, what, what, where you're getting that joint pain from. And I think that should help. And, and your previous caller, too. I think all of those things should help a lot of people today. Well, thank you for calling in, Lori. And I think it brings up, like I said, we go back to this is that joint pain isn't always just coming from the joint. And you've got to look at all the different factors that's going on with someone's health in order to really not only assess and evaluate what's going on and diagnose it, but then come up with a treatment plan to help support the other structures around that joint too. Right. And and to kind of go a little bit deeper on the last caller, when it comes to the meniscus, which is basically a cartilage pad between two bones, it's, it's not much different than the disc in your low back. When you have disc degeneration or meniscal degeneration, you have to look at how well those joints are moving. If their if their movement is is poor, then what typically happens is you start to put more weight on that connective tissue, which accelerates its degeneration. So, in, in many cases of, of folks who take hyaluronic acid or MSM or chondroitin that don't get benefit, I think it's probably not because it's not helpful, but because the pressure on that sensitive tissue is not removed. So it's just, it can't overwhelm that, that type of irritation. So you have to address that first. So make sure the muscles that surround it are strong. Um, you know, make sure that, that, that you have full extension and flexion in the knee and all those types of things. Yeah. I think it's interesting too, when I've seen some of the patients that you treat or we've co-treated together, um, I know you're a big advocate with taping as well too. So getting that movement back into that joint, like, like if it's a knee joint or something, but then helping to support the, the structures around there. So that way that joint's got a chance to heal instead of just going back to the same wear and tear that it's, it's always going through. Yeah. If, if you don't, if you don't address that component, then it just, it's, it's a lot longer process than it needs to be. Yeah. When we think about joints itself, the anatomy of it too, I mean, this is more than just the bone on bone. Like you mentioned, we have meniscus and bursa and the ligaments and the muscles kind of surrounding that. When do we have to start considering if there's those particular things are part of the issue or is it, you know, always thinking about arthritis and the degeneration of those actual, you know, bone on bone joints? You know, those structures are almost always involved. The question becomes one of those primary and for a lot of people that have, let's say, demonstrable arthritis on, in their knee, they take an x-ray and there's, there's arthritis. The arthritis might be a byproduct of the inflammation in the tendons that are crossing the knee and all those other things. So even though there's a gener degenerative process that's, that's taking place, your therapies early on might be directed towards the connective tissue that crosses it. So we don't want this to be like a false flag where well, if it's on x-ray, then it has to be the problem because in many cases, especially low back problems, it, it, it's usually not the primary issue. It's just, a, it's just a side effect of the instability that's been in place for a long period of time. And when we start to see joint pain as well, um, you know, throughout the whole body, and we, we briefly mentioned on kind of the autoimmune causes or if there's a infection, um, you know, some of the things that kind of we don't always think about is going to cause joint pain. How do we start questioning if there are metabolic issues involved or how would someone else kind of need to evaluate before they're coming in so they can give their doctors the best uh, information? Well, you, you really should ask the person about if they have any other comorbidities. Do they have diabetes? Do they have any type of inflammatory uh, connective tissue disorders, you know, all those things. Are they on medications? Um, I, I see a lot of people on statins that develop muscle pain and they assume that there's a muscle problem when it's a side effect of the medication. So you need to ask all those different components. But to get to your question about global pain, that's when I really start to think about the body just shifting more to this inflammatory state so you want to look at all those blood tests that I'm going to, I'm going to go over and you have to look closely at the diet. If yeah. the diet is acidic in nature because we have a lot of grains or refined flours or sugars, then we're going to, we're going to shift from a, an alkaline environment to an acidic environment. 
And that's very caustic to the body and it causes it to break down faster because we utilize a lot of buffering minerals to, to quench that fire, so to speak. So the magnesiums, the calciums, the potassiums will be pulled from tissue to, to help um, buffer the acidity because of our diet being poor. And you talked about with the hyaluronic uh, acid and the fluid that's kind of in the joint space as well, too, just overall body hydration to help out with the acidity balance and also get fluid to those joint spaces is going to be really important as well. Absolutely. So, you know, connected tissue is probably, you know, 60, 70 percent water. So if you're dehydrated and you're in pain, uh, you, you need to do something about that sooner than later because you're going to be taking the Advils and all the over the counter stuff and it's not going to help. And, and a lot of people just don't drink enough water. And, and over time, the nervous system will not tell you that you're thirsty anymore. So I, I see patients all the time that might have three glasses of water all day and then probably have two or three glasses of, uh, of, of coffee, which is a diuretic. But yet they're, they say they're not thirsty, but that doesn't mean their tissue isn't thirsty. Right. It's kind of like when you try to, I always tell patients, like when to go back to ligaments, like if you have a stick and it's really, it's in your woods and you're, it's really dry, it's easy to crack. But if it's kind of got the flirt, the nourishment and the water in there, it kind of bends like a reed a little bit more. So you want that to kind of be like the ligaments and the connective tissue of the body as well, too. So absolutely. Hydration can never hurt you for that part. <laughs> no, no, it can't. And then the, the other thing, and I'm going to definitely touch on it is the importance of good fats in the diet. We have omega-3 fats, which which follow a pathway to be anti-inflammatories. And then we have the omega-6 fats, uh, which are the corns and the wheats and all those types of things. The pathway that they most likely take is, is to cause inflammation. So if, if you have a combination of an acidic type diet, poor fats and a hydration issue, then it, that's, a, that's a big cauldron of, of bad news right there. So just changing your diet and, and, and hydrating yourself for a lot of people can be a game changer and they just don't realize it. And I would think that that would play a really important consideration, especially if people are noticing chronic pain that isn't going away or it kind of has it comes and goes, but there's no, you know, injury or, or accident that kind of they can put their hands on there, like that inflammation, that build up, like you said, over time. Um, if right. their diet hasn't changed, even though they've done all this uh, PT work or structural work, it, it's still going to be there. It, it definitely will still be there. So they, those are the folks that should start tracking what they eat in their diet. And they might also want to consider that they have some, you know, hidden food allergies, some delayed hypersensitivities to foods. Now, most people think of an allergy as I get stung by a bee and I can't breathe. Well, I mean, that's, that's an a, acute anaphylactic situation. We have these delayed sensitivities. We call it IgG that might not show up for 24 to 72 hours. So if I have dairy, for example, and I feel fine today, but tomorrow I'm all congested, I might not ever think about that, that glass of milk or, or, you know, the bowl of cereal as being an issue. So um, elimination diets are, are, are a simple way a person can kind of see if changing their diet as far as removing things can help. So just pick one thing, let's say wheat or gluten. So, you know, gluten is the antigen that causes a lot of issues in wheat. Just totally pull it from your diet and Google where what the sources are for like four or five days and ask yourself, do I feel better? If you feel better, then that tells you something. Then what you probably want to do is reintroduce it to see if you all of a sudden feel bad again. Mm -hmm. For those folks who aren't sure if they felt better after they've stopped it, then if they, if they take it or start eating it again and they start feeling poorly, they probably have a reaction to it. Now, what I think is also interesting, too, since we see families coming in, it makes sense when we talk about arthritis and, and joint pain with someone who's a little bit older. But when we start seeing teenage kids come in and when we start seeing someone who's younger that their joint quality should still be intact, do we have to look at them differently from a natural perspective or do, and, and do the same information apply to them as well as it would with an older adult? I think the information still is is relevant, but it would be very unlikely that the that a young person has osteoarthritis. There's a chance that they could have what's called juvenile rheumatoid, but that's really not that that common. So with the young kids, I look for what what I refer to as overuse syndromes. Um, they're just using the body over and over again beyond its capacity. And a lot of times you'll see that when kids go through a growth spurt, their bones grow much faster than their muscles. So the muscles don't catch up to the, to the bones. So 
their joints are less stable and then all of a sudden now they have that that knee tendonitis or they have a shoulder problem um you know after they might have grown one or two inches in, in you know four month period and I also think we see a lot of young athletes coming in that it's almost like they have the overuse injury because their body's still growing and developing and then they're really doing a lot of sports injuries kind of also in there. So we're kind of trying to prevent not only treat their acute pain, but trying to prevent anything later on as well, too. Absolutely. So the, all these injuries compound and make it more likely that, you know, when we're older, that we do get our, you know, osteoarthritis. Okay, we're going to be back in just a moment and stay tuned. Washington's Mall, 105.9 FM, WMAL. Welcome back to Dr. Tom Was All Live. We are, I'm on the radio show with Dr. Harlan Browning, and we are talking about three common causes of joint pain, but we know that there's so much more, and there's so much more in depth that we had to do another webinar on it. Hopefully, you're going to be able to join us, and the only way to do that first is to register, and there's a couple of different ways you can do that. You can call the office at 703-698-7117. Again, that's 703-698-7117, and tell them that you want to register for Dr. Browning's lecture for this Wednesday, the August the 26th. And you can also go onto our website, uh, roselcare.com, and go about halfway down the page. You'll see a big sign that says three common causes of joint pain and a button underneath there that says register. So all you have to do is click on that. You're going to give them a little bit of information, and then they're going to email you the webinar. And so you're going to be able to play that at home on your own. Um, you'll be able to go back to it as well, too. Um, and so the good thing is you'll be able to get this information, and hopefully not only that will be beneficial for you, but for others. While you're there on the website as well, take a look at all of our other topics that we've been recording um, in the past over a number of years. You can scroll down more and see uh, just about all the doctors I now think have a presentation on there. Everything from sugar, public enemy number one, to thyroid issues, um, how emotions affect your health, cardiovascular health and issues, allergy, pain management, um, back and spinal pain and headaches. Um, so Dr. Browning's got a number of different lectures on there as well. Um, so they're great. You can watch them in the comfort of your own home, really getting under an idea of how we think at the Result Center feeling and how we pull different things together um, from a more natural mindset and really how education is important. Dr. Browning, can you go over just a review of what you're going to be kind of covering during this webinar and why it's so important that everyone uh, register and tune in? Yeah, sure. So um, we're going to go through a lot of the mechanisms of pain, specifically the inflammatory cascade that takes uh, takes place. Going to look at those three causes, the mechanical, the referred, uh, and the metabolic causes of, of pain and pain disorders. And I'm going to break down a lot of the therapies that we utilize in the office that are they're conservative and they're constructive. They actually fix things. And we'll, we'll certainly give you some take home things of things that you can implement at home and some testing that you can request from your doctor. I mean, the more information you have about you, yourself, the better. And hopefully we can change some people's lives and, and, and get them pointed in the right direction. Yeah, I think you bring up a great point and, and we keep coming back to it that a lot of times there's more than one cause. There's more than one way to treat it, but then putting things together really treats it from a couple of different angles. And, you know, that's what we do such a great job with that. The Result Center for Healing is really trying to, you know, figure out the different causes that are being overlooked and, you know, what can people do on their own and how do we get to the spot to begin with? So, yeah. So, and, and, you know, we've got to break the cycle of just taking, you know, over the counter pain meds and anti-inflammatories because they're in the long run, they're extremely counterproductive and they actually, they further the, the the disease process along. So that's that's the biggie for me. There's just too many people popping too many pills on a daily basis because that's what they're told their option is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so something like chiropractic and acupuncture and nutrition and, and massage and stuff all work together synergistically and, you know, makes a great combination overall in the long run. So. Yeah, and that's why, you know, we call them, it's complementary medicine. You know, it mm -hmm. has its place, and, and for many people, it's, it's, the, it's the path they should have been on originally, but they, they, re they refuse to look at other options outside of, you know, the, the bottle of Advil in their closet. 
Yeah, we tend to get them on the the other side of things at the end when they really need to, you know, there's things they shouldn't be doing the whole time. So I want to thank Dr. Browning for being my guest. Uh, Dr. Rosella, I think we'll be back uh, on the radio show next week and, again, answering questions about how you've tried and applied and we need to find some natural solutions. Thank you for listening in, and don't forget to register for this weekend's lecture. Are you dental phobic? Do you neglect your dental health because of fear and anxiety? A beautiful smile begins with exceptional dental care, and you can trust in the expertise of Soft Touch Dental Care and Dr. Michael Chung. Soft Touch Dental Care is unlike any dentist office you'll ever experience. Their warm and welcoming environment is designed to soothe fears and anxiety the moment you arrive, and they're especially pleased to pamper their honored guest patients. Dr. Michael Chung is a professional and leading expert in all areas of comprehensive dentistry, including cosmetic, sedation, neuromuscular, TMJ, and implant dentistry. Offering state-of-the-art technology, Dr. Chung can give you the smile of your dreams. Arrange for a complimentary consultation today with Dr. Michael Chung and experience the expertise that makes Dr. Michael Chung so unique. Call 703-319-6990. That's 703-319-6990. Or visit bestinsmile.com. That's bestinsmile.com. This is Dr. Tom Rosell, author of Ageless Health. Health is a do-it-yourself program. My book, now also available in audio version, is a step-by-step program of how to take control of your health and wellness without drugs or needless surgery. You have the capacity to change your health and level of well-being. Take control of your health today and order Health Is a Do-It-Yourself Program. For more information and to order, please visit agelesshealthbook.com. That's agelesshealthbook.com. Breast cancer is a major health risk to all women. It can silently grow uninterrupted for years. The Thermography Centers of Fairfax reminds all women to conduct monthly and annual breast exams. Consider a thermography scan from the Thermography Centers as an adjunct to your routine breast exams. Digital infrared thermal imaging is safe and non-invasive. For more information and to schedule an appointment, call 703-520-7591 or visit thermographycenters.com.